Guten Morgen, meine Damen und Herren. Ich möchte mit einem alten Gedanken starten. Das heißt, die Ökonomie, Ökonomie neu denken, ein alter Gedanke, Kostenminimierung. Ich glaube, alle verstehen Englisch hier, aber nicht alle Deutsch. Deshalb habe ich gedacht, ich rede auf Englisch. So, let's start in English and um, minimize translation costs. Uh, the topic that I'm talking about is challenges of economic thinking in practice. And what I'd like to do is to share with you a little bit my experience that I had Mr. Stobek already indicated uh, that I, 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 like many others, went through a learning curve in the course of this uh, crisis. And I'd like to share a little bit with you my learning experience and um, uh, would like to start with the main takeaways that I have so far um, uh, developed out of my learning experience. Um, the first point is that uh, conventional economics really did not anticipate this financial crisis. Remember that uh, uh, Mr. Bernanke started out in 2007 when the subprime crisis broke, uh, saying that this is a problem in a small segment of the American mortgage market and shouldn't bother us too much. So we didn't really understand um, and did not anticipate uh, this financial crisis. I shall argue that we cannot really, with conventional economics, uh, explain it well, and we can also therefore um, not understand, uh, not make really sound recomm recommendations on how to overcome it. Um, and the reason for all this is that, as I found out myself when I try to analyze this crisis, we don't understand the credit cycle well enough with conventional uh, economics. When we try to understand what went on, so to speak, real time, um, when the uh, crisis hit us in the course of 2007, as Mr. Stobek already mentioned, uh, I think many of us, uh, I certainly, uh, went back to uh, look at economic history because the models were failing us. And we were trying to learn from uh, precedents on what one could do in, this, in these uh, uh, circumstances. And, and when you go back in economic history, you then also come across um, older economic theories that were discarded, sort of looked at superfluous, uh, when the um, conventional economics was developed, the modern macroeconomics was developed. And I think these older theories can tell us a lot um, uh, for what has been going on. They are, of course, um, you know, not, not perfect. Uh, they are a starting point, and uh, we may well go back to these uh, uh, pre-modern economic theories uh, and start thinking from there again. Um, what I also learned in the course of this crisis is that um, we should um, move more towards uh, an inductive approach uh, in economics. Uh, economics, in a way, wanted to be like natural science. We uh, were coming ever closer to try to mimic physics. We start with a few axioms, and then we derive in a very logical, mathematical fashion our theories. But I think we forgot when doing this, we forgot that uh, economics is a social science. And in the social sciences, uh, you have to work with induction. So you have to look at history, you have to try to uh, work out uh, themes in history. I'm not saying that we should discard our models, but we need to complement them uh, with historical analysis, use um, what uh, scientists in the social sciences use, the method of induction. Um, and we have to be, I would also say, we have to be a bit more uh, interdisciplinarian. We have to, to uh, reach out. Uh, I already mentioned history, but I, I would also um, add to that psychology, and I would also like to add to that sociology and um, uh, more recently, perhaps even medicine, to understand better how brains operate, how we process um, decisions, how we arrive at decisions, how we process information. So we need to, to open up, really, uh, to other sciences in a much broader way and not focus uh, so strongly onto this ideal that we want to be natural scientists and be very hard and very mathematical you know, and very elitist sometimes. 
So what were the macroeconomic consequences of conventional economics? Well, um, most of you in this room probably lived through the rational expectations uh, revolution of the early 80s. I remember uh, still as a young economist at the IMF, uh, Bob Lucas um, in the early 80s giving a lecture there. I was so much impressed. I mean, I was all rational expectations, all efficient markets. And that, of course, had uh, a lot of consequences when you assume that um, uh, expectations are rational and uh, when you then add on, as we did then in the course of the 80s, remember Eugene Farmer theory of um, thes uh, thesis of efficient markets, when you add this all on, uh, you can actually develop very nice um, economic models that uh, you can then condense for monetary policy purposes, you can condense um, uh, to uh, showing that inflation targeting is the optimal approach uh, for monetary policy. Uh, you will remember the work uh, of the inflation target people like Lars Svensson who uh, sort of showed uh, in very impressive models that this is the way to go. You will also remember that uh, the ECB's uh, two-pillar strategy was at the beginning when they launched it uh, considered to be sort of an old-fashioned relic from earlier times, not really up to scratch of modern uh, academics. Um, when you uh, run monetary policy as an inflation targeting exercise, then you operate monetary policy like a dentist. Uh, remember Mervyn King's uh, description of inflation targeting? It's like dentistry. You focus on a very small part of the body and you operate on this small part, part of the body with very high precision and you ignore the rest because the rest takes care of itself. You don't have to look at asset prices because when people are rational and markets efficient, why bother? Uh, you follow a regulation light approach uh, because the market knows best, of course. People are rational, markets are efficient. So all have, you have to do as a regulator, you make sure that financial market participants have the appropriate driver's license. So they need simply to understand all the legal uh, framework, the, the business economics uh, of, uh, of, of finance, uh, but they don't have to bother about the macro picture. The word macro prudential regulation was something that we only, I think, invented uh, more recently. So you ignore what is going on, um, on in, in the asset markets and, uh, as I said, you you can be quite um, easy on everything else except the um, inflation target that uh, you want to control. And uh, in fact, when you do this, you run into the risk of uh, suffering from control illusion. It's perhaps a bit ironic, you know, that the people who thought that the markets are so rational and uh, um, uh, people are so rational, markets so efficient, then developed such a high esteem for central bankers. Um, a, bit in, a bit inconsequential, but eventually, I think, if the central bank sort of is the uh, engine room of, of, of a modern economy with inflation targeting, then you can perhaps understand uh, Mr. Grugman's remark here that you can read. Um, control illusion. I think um, we thought that in modern... Uh, economics, we could control everything and in a sense we put the central banks in the center and the central bank would just do what is necessary um, and then we would have everything under control. Well, modern, macro, modern economics, uh, modern finance now, I was talking about modern macroeconomics but modern uh, finance, uh, also had profound implications uh, for the way that we run our businesses in the financial industry. Modern finance is perhaps the part of uh, modern economics that is most directly applied um, in industry. Uh, I think macroeconomics sort of through central banking found its way here into macroeconomic policy making. But modern finance had a direct business impact. You all remember the uh, Black-Scholes option pricing formula. Um, when shortly after uh, Fisher Black and, and, and Schultz developed this formula, Hewlett Packard came up with a pocket calculator where this formula was uh, programmed in. And from that uh, moment onwards, uh, the Black Schultz formula basically determined the option prices. 
So traders, which in the past were trading options more on the basis of uh, uh, gut feeling or you know how many, what was the demand supply, so sort of like like you would trade oranges. So had a scientific instrument at their hand. Computing power was there, uh, and computing power and modern finance played an enormous role in shaping um, our industry. When you assume that people are rational, markets are efficient, and then when you make, make another little trick, um, you assume that uh, you know the probability distribution of financial prices. Uh, and um, you may perhaps want to make another further little trick and uh, assume that they are normal. If you make all these assumptions, then you can develop wonderful tools. Uh, modern portfolio theory, so Henry Markowitz, um, portfolio optimization, all what goes with that is um, largely based on these assumptions. In fact, if you strip away normal distribution, you have a big problem with conventional uh, portfolio optimizers. You can still do a little bit by uh, you know, introducing um, distributions, probability distributions that are a bit like normal, so you can vary a bit. Remember all the famous fat tails. Uh, but when you take it away, when you take uh, the assumption of normality away, you have a big, big problem with all uh, our um, modern portfolio theory. Take away the assumption that uh, you know the distribution. Move on to a world of Nietzschean uncertainty, where, as Donald Rumsfeld once put it, the unknown unknowns rule. And you can forget about modern portfolio theory. That's the end of it. But, you know, we made all these assumptions, we employed it, and uh, we basically built the industry on it. Without modern portfolio theory, you couldn't imagine all these things, these nice products that we have produced. Um, collateralized mortgage obligations, collateralized debt obligations, all that stuff. Risk minimization through, you know, correlations. All that stuff is based basically on um, these theories. You can run companies based on these theories. Uh, value at risk, the model of value at risk, you feed in these assumptions that I've listed here. You feed these assumptions um, into the model and you can actually control your risk precisely. And uh, as uh, I progressed in this industry, as computing power grew, um, with value at risk, I observed that we could initially, uh, when I was sitting here not far away in the mesotome, you know, we had a, a, a weekly meeting where we would uh, check where is uh, our risk. Uh, these meetings then turned into to daily affairs. Then they did no longer this things were no longer meetings because uh, you didn't even have to, to discuss much. The stuff would come out real time. You would know real time as a, as a bank manager, you would know real time what your risk was up to the last cent um, continuously. Um, all based on, on these models. Of course, this was all a big illusion. Um, take away the assumptions and you have a very, very big um, problem. Of course, when you know your risk, um, you can run the system really fast, sort of sailing with a lot of wind. You leverage up because you can control risk. Uh, when you know your risk, uh, the lever can be um, very, very, very large. You can run this system like a just-in-time production system. So the corollary to what we have done here in finance is what you can see in logistics with just-in-time production. Um, however, you have to rely on these things and then you can leverage up and everything works perfectly um, unless these things disappear. Here's another example of the control illusion that was created as a result of modern finance. Long, some of you may remember long-term capital management. Uh, they employed two uh, winners of the Nobel Prize um, as their partners. Um, the founder, John Merriweather, was a very um, acclaimed uh, trader, uh, made famous in the wonderful book, uh, Liar's Poker, uh, by Michael Lewis. Um, I worked for that company, incidentally. Uh, I started my career at that company when John Merriweather was still there. Um, uh, they had a bit of an accident and I had to move on. Uh, later on, uh, they actually increased uh, their 
um, leverage, as you can see here, from this uh, quote about uh, long-term capital management. Um, they had an equity of $4.7 billion. Uh, um, leveraged this up uh, by borrowing to total assets of 125, 124.5 billion US dollars. But with that, they ran a portfolio of derivatives, which is another way of leveraging things up, of 1.25 trillion. Quite extraordinary. Um, very, very, very scientific. Um, the, the, this was the avant-garde of modern finance that was um, running this firm, basically. And when I, after they have come down, when I talked to another hedge fund manager, um, he basically said they were like pilots of a jumbo jet, uh, looking at their GPS system, relying 100% of this GPS, GPS system because they had designed it themselves and forgot to look out of the window and therefore didn't see the mountain in which they were running. So control illusion. Well, if you have these, uh, um, these theories, um, you build up all this, uh, this leverage. Um, and what if the assumptions do not hold? Well, you do not create the brave new world of big leverage. Um, you create the biggest credit bubble of all times, and this is, I think, what we have seen. Um, of course, there were many, many bubbles before. Um, some of you may have read this uh, wonderful 19th century classic about popular delusions and the madness of crowds, and you know, can go back to the um, 17th century from the Tulip bubble in the um, Netherlands to all sorts of South Sea bubble, and so on and so forth. But um, this is an unsubstantiated claim that I'm making, so I have to be careful. But I don't think that in world history we have ever built um, a bubble that was bigger and more global than the one that we have built on the basis of modern finance. So, when the credit bubble burst, this house of cards came down. Very quickly, as a reminder, I said um, we had the subprime crisis that initially was seen as just a little accident on the road, but turned out um, as the you know, canary in the coal mine. Uh, when it dropped off its rails, it was suggesting that the whole um, uh, house uh, was beginning to unravel. We moved on to the money market crisis, banking crisis, the public debt crisis, right, the euro crisis, all uh, in one sequence. These things are all interconnected. I could go on for a long time and tol tol tell you the interconnectedness, but i just watching my uh, clock here. Uh, I have to, uh, to go on. What is at the end of it? Right now we are replacing credit with money, but this is not money in the sense that it is very material. It's, it's also a credit instrument, right? right? It is fiat money. So I'm wondering, I, I put this with a question mark, what is the next stage in this crisis? Probably a crisis of the fiat money system. We don't have it, fortunately, yet. Everyone is, expect, is accepting money still as a payment to settle credit relations. But what if we question that? I'll come back to this. So I mentioned at the beginning, we were going back to um, old theories to try to understand what was going on. And uh, you come up with, uh, with two, which I found very interesting. Uh, on the one hand, the post-Keynesian uh, economics, with uh, the economists who describe the credit cycle very well. Uh, and this is the, the problem in, with modern uh, macroeconomics and modern finance. There is no role for credit. Um, uh, I was in, a, in 2006, I was at a, at a conference at the, that the ECB gave here in Frankfurt. And they had uh, all the top economists uh, there from the US. And Michael Woodford, who is one of the um, key people in uh, you know, popularizing in inflation targeting and developing the models, and he was giving his speech. And then some young lady from a London hedge fund stood up and says, where is credit in your model? Uh, and he said, oh, it's not there, we don't need it. Uh, I could easily attach it. Uh, but you know, it's five minutes and I write a, a few equations and that's it. Uh, I think that was underestimated the power, underestimating the power of credit. And these old theories, here give much more attention to credit. I'll come to this in a moment. Uh, 
Minsky explains the credit cycle in a in a way that is 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 much more insightful than the way that we have treated uh, credit in macro modern macro and and finance and the Austrians also I think have uh, put credit in the center of their business cycle theory very quickly to recap um, the Minsky cycle you know uh, you start out uh, where people borrow basically uh, to with a view to pay back their debt so they borrow and then they make payments um, uh, the payments comprise um, interest of course and principal repayment it's a classical mortgage that I think many of you in this room uh, probably have uh, when the party heats up uh, you get a little bit more relaxed uh, you still pay your interest but you roll your outstanding principal why not you know the markets are deep the markets are liquid there's always um, a lender who would lend you again when your principal expires you are quite happy in just uh, now paying interest uh, when the whole thing becomes uh, really heated up and Minsky calls this, uh, calls this in the Ponzi phase, then you borrow to um, pay principal and interest. You know, you roll things forward because your asset prices appreciate, your assets appreciate in such a rate that you don't even have to bother to pay interest anymore. You can um, sell your assets at an um, elevated price that pays all your costs principle as well as interest and when you're there then it takes only a little change in the constellation a small increase in the cost of borrowing maybe induced by the central bank which changes a little bit the industry then you experience the Minsky moment the house of card comes down and you move downhill and some people at the financial crisis you were saying so 2007 was the Minsky moment the Fed had increased interest rates and then uh, that triggered the unraveling of this whole house of cards i like minsky a lot i read this book came timely uh, there was a new uh, release uh, timely at the financial crisis i think it came out 2008 or so it's a great book to read um, but when you come to the conclusions that the post keynesians make you kind of wonder is that really it because they really want to regulate regulate and regulate and they want to um, have financial regulation uh, this goes back to sort of the roosevelt answer to um, the uh, Great Depression, so separate uh, the uh, banking sector. Uh, you want to have a fiscal, pro very active fiscal policy, big government. Uh, you want to have an incomes policy. So the Minsky book is about uh, 80, 90 percent. It's great, and the last 10 percent, you wonder what he's talking about. I mean, we've gone through this right in the 70s, and we've thought we found out that all that stuff really is not is not really working. So great analysis, but policy recommendations, I I found wanting. Um, go to the Austrians. This is the Austrian cycle. Um, goes back to the concept of the natural interest rate. You know, Knut Vixell. Um, here we have GDP expanding. Uh, the market rate is e equals to the natural rate. So the natural rate gives you um, is a reflection of the return to capital. As long as these two match, everything moves in equilibrium. Uh, then the uh, market rate goes below the natural rate. It becomes uh, um, attractive to borrow to invest this can happen through a mistake by the central bank the central bank puts the policy rate down drags the rest of the market rates down you get an investment boom because the rate of return to capital is above the costs um, of capital you get an investment boom you get an asset price boom uh, you get a big expansion at some stage um, the either the natural rate comes down through an exogenous shock or the market rate goes up because the central bank gets worried about the situation um, the market rate goes above the natural rate and the whole thing unravels again you could say a description a bit you could use that description also of what has happened uh, both the Minsky cycle and the um, Austrian cycle sort of play around with this uh, um, phases of, uh, you know, of, of, of aggressiveness of borrowing and cost of funds. The Austrians, um, I think, uh, when I compare this, let's say, with the post Keynesians, the Austrians uh, also had a problem, and actually they lift out their problem uh, in the uh, early 30s because that was the predominant theory uh, when we had it, uh, when we went into a recession in 1929, and you may recall 
the famous uh, statement by Andrew Mellon, who was, uh, I would say, well, certainly not a theorist of the of the uh, Austrian economists, but he kind of um, translated them into reality, and this had the effect that uh, Austrian economics also has been given the name of the liquidationists, as he was at some stage, you can see, he was um, calling for um, the liquidation of labor, the liquidation of stocks, farmers, everything, liquidate real estate and purge the rottenness out of the system. So that was the idea that uh, you could um, actually uh, go back to equilibrium once you have done away with the excesses. Problem, however, is that if the risk aversion doesn't come down, you know, the Austrians presume that some, at some point the system goes back into, into equilibrium. But what if r rising risk aversion, because of a rising risk premium, keeps the market rate above the natural rate, the system doesn't stabilize. It sort of goes downhill forever and you over uh, liquidate. So what, you can, what can you do? Um, I think what, what you have to do when you are in such a situation, you have to reopen the credit channel. You have to do something against the um, uh, ever-growing risk aversion. The system sort of gets stuck and gets caught in a downward spiral. And you have to pay attention to the credit channel. Um, I have to say I'm leaning more towards here um, uh, but using the Austrian uh, economics as a basis of uh, how to, to go uh, um, about and uh, the present situation and think about how you can go forward than the Keynesians because uh, I think the, the Austrian uh, side is, I believe, easier to fix. Uh, I'm not convinced about the post-Keynesians uh, policy implications of ever tighter regulation and ever, more, ever bigger government. I think that Austrian uh, situation is perhaps better to fix. I will show you how. This is a chart that we did um, in towards the end of 09, beginning uh, end of 08, beginning of 09. Um, you may uh, remember that people generally have said the um, credit is a lagging indicator of uh, the business cycle. I think people made what I would call a category mistake. They plotted um, demand changes against credit stock changes, which is of course is is is, is a nonsense. You have to uh, look at changes in credit flows against changes in demand flows. And this is the 1930s. Um, uh, uh, you can see here how the Roosevelt, well, actually it's here, the Roosevelt policy um, of reassuring uh, depositors and recapitalizing the banks uh, lifted credit uh, from its compressed state, gave you an impulse uh, upwards. Uh, so it tells you something about the importance of reopening the credit channel, but it also tells you that uh, this is just a short-term measure. You cannot rely that the system remains stable. In fact, uh, this is the credit cycle of the U.S. since the um, stock market crash of 1929. It actually fits very well. Um, <coughs> I don't think that many people before us sort of looked at the changes in credit flows and reconstructed the changes of credit flows in the U.S. on a consistent basis back to 1928. But when you do this, you see a very clear um, uh, correlation between the credit cycle and, uh, and the real economy cycle, and especially in times of crisis, I think the reopening of the credit uh, channel is absolutely crucial. Um, what you have here, this is the Roosevelt moment, and you could call this perhaps the Paulson moment. This is when they did the top and they reopened the credit channel and that helped us certainly to go up. The question is now, are we as unstable? Probably yes, as unstable as we were in the 30s. Um, I will not dwell more on this um, because of the uh, time. I think it is um, very important that we better understand the nature of credit. There is a, a, a book which I like a lot. It came out um, in the middle of last year, um, very heterodox. So anyone li of you liking heterodox books, I recommend this, David Graeber, uh, Debt, the First 5,000 Years. It's a history of debt, no less than 5,000 years history of debt. And, and the point that, that Graeber makes is that credit and trust is absolutely important. Uh, we thought that we could replace trust by financial engineering. We, fall flat, we fell flat on our faces. Um, the products didn't uh, hold what uh, we were promising. Trust has disappeared, and um, it's all about trust. A credit crisis is a crisis of trust, uh, and we need to bring back 
trust in the system. Right now, we are replacing credit by fiat money, which is just another form of credit. Um, this is a stopgap measure. I don't think that it is the final answer, um, especially if we lose trust in fiat money. So um, I skip that one. Um, what are the, now the challenges around basically up what I said at the beginning? We need to understand the credit cycle and the nature of credit much better. Uh, we need to uh, accept that we live in a world of night and uncertainty with unknown unknowns where we don't even know the probability distribution of events. We need to become more inter interdisciplinary. And I think um, we have to open up and admit that we are no physicists. Thank you very much. I have two questions um, to start with. The first question is, uh, crisis of fiat money would mean hyperinflation, basically, wouldn't it? In the end, yes. You could uh, think that people go out of the um, paper money. I mean, paper money is a little bit of a euphemism. Right? It's no longer in paper. They, they go out of, out of paper money and um, use other means. You could, could go back to yeah, a metallic base of money, which you cannot augment at the uh, at a mouse click. So this would be a re reaction by, by people who don't trust the fiat money yeah. anymore, not not a decision by policymakers who would switch over the system to no, I I think know, it would new be gold yeah, standard. See, I, I look at this also as a, as a crisis of trust. Um, uh, we had, uh, uh, it started out with the loss of trust in financial engineering, uh, when the products that we had uh, um, credit products, you know, that we had constructed turned out faulty. That was the first round. We had a, we had a crisis in the private um, credit sector. Um, and then when we moved in uh, September, October 2009, the Greek government owned up that they had lied about their numbers. So there was a, a crisis of trust in um, public sector accounts. Um, a crisis of trust in the elements of EMU. Uh, and therefore, the, the crisis of trust that started out in the private sector with these products swapped over, became a crisis of trust um, in the public sector, starting in the Eurozone. And you wonder, when you look at the sequence, uh, we are now using um, the agreed legal tender, uh, which is only a convention. Some people say a symbol, money is a symbol. We are now using that to replace credit relationships, which were no longer accepted because of the collapse of trust. Uh, but we are hoping that uh, by replacing these credit relationships with money, which is also another form of credit, uh, that this will do the trick. But we are running the risk that in the end, people lose, would lose trust in that instrument, and that could be, have very far-reaching consequences. This would be probably even more detrimental than uh, the things we, we've already uh, experienced. Uh, that would perhaps be even more detrimental yeah. indeed, yes. So, but what would be the alternative to, to the uh, things uh, central banks are doing right now? I mean, I think it was absolutely right, you know, that we uh, stopped the Austrian cycle from disintegrating downwards. Um, from that point of view, you can say that uh, uh, the Fed and uh, the Treasury in the US had learned their lessons. Uh, instead of having three years of mitigated liquid unmitigated liquidation, we had uh, two quarters, so that was a great achievement. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm afraid there is now this uh, feeling that uh, we um, have things now under control again, and we can um, now restore uh, the economy back to trend growth, trend being defined as we knew it before, through the means of monetary policy. So the old-fashioned output gap minimization, uh, just inject more money into the system, uh, remember the talk about the Fed's uh, unemployment target rate, uh, that they should perhaps even uh, establish that as the uh, new target and pump money into the system. I think this is relying a lot um, on the trust in the system. And if that disappears, if they fail to deliver, we have a problem. All right. Um, one second question re relating the, to your to your criticism of, of, of how modern finance works and how those models were used. Let, uh, let we, we don't have to talk about specific financial institutions, but mm -hmm. currently, oh. I, I mean, those models are still being used in, 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 in the big banks, aren't they? Yeah, they're still being used. Um, uh, 
for the want of something better and in a sense you know the system sort of goes on uh, you have to you use something um, uh, of course they are looked at now with much uh, greater reservation and there is no longer such a blind belief in these things and one tries to use uh, judgment one has also moved away of course from uh, value at risk towards uh, uh, now relying on stress tests, which is sort of, the, you know, the name of the game these days. You can already see this, this uh, cropping up of the of, of these two words, stre stress test. That was something yeah. that in modern finance uh, has no role. So one is trying to move on, but we haven't found a, a stable base again. Uh, when you think about portfolio man uh, management these days, how do you do it? I mean, it, it, it's almost borders on the ri ridiculous that to come down, you know, to the old saying, well, distribute your assets over many, many uh, yeah. classes. So what does it mean we are still using the GPS, but we're looking uh, out of the window also? Or, or is, is the GPS generally flawed and we shouldn't trust it anymore well, at all? If, if you do want to use that analogy, sort of is, is it, it, it is giving you conflicting signals, <laughs> right? And you sort of try to, to look at the map that you see around it to maybe get some impression where you stand, but at the same time you look out of the window and see whether this GPS still is giving you any sense of direction. It, it is a very difficult period. Um, I think almost it almost feels between times yeah. in macroeconomics as well as in modern finance. So in, in between times, because we know that the old era has ended, but exactly. we don't know what's going we to, to we follow. We don't know what the new paradigm yeah. uh, is going to be. The old paradigm clearly is broken, but the new yeah. paradigm hasn't emerged. And in between, and that was part of here of uh, my of my slides. In between, we're, we're looking back and uh, trying to uh, to make do with uh, old stuff that we've dug up, that yeah. we dug up again. All right. Um, yeah, I would like to, to allow maybe for, for, for a couple of questions. Um, don't hesitate to ask in German if you, if you feel more comfortable. Hi, um, I have a question regarding the models. Um, as you said, we don't trust our risk models anymore because we're, we're not quite sure what distribution we're drawing from and obviously that's a flawed system. But um, academic economics has an answer to that, which is modeling ambiguity or night in uncertainty, which is basically modeling the unknown of the unknown, right? And my question would be, um, you, or could it be an answer that we now use those models in banks? Are they used? Or are people more and more moving towards just going back to gut feelings uh, when they actually make trade decisions? Well, I don't know how you can model numerically the unknown of the unknown. We, you can we do that by saying we're not drawing from one distribution, but we have a range of distributions from which we're drawing, and we sort of allow for this corridor of distributions. So we're not talking yeah. about point priors anymore, which were obviously too optimistic, but we're allowing for a range of distributions. So, so this is something that, that's entered the academic debate um, some time ago, and I was going to ask whether yeah. that would possibly enter. I think these are all uh, uh, elements now that uh, you would have to develop further uh, to make it uh, applicable in practice. There's also the limited <coughs> knowledge economics. I mean, Mr. Jungen has uh, some uh, recently promoted a book here by Friedman and uh, someone, uh, another one, right? Yeah. So, so they're, all, they're interesting new. Um, uh, things development in the academic field. Um, right now for practical applications, it's after all my theme, um, we simply draw the conclusion we don't know the future. If you don't know the future, you need to have a bigger buffer for risk. You know? This is about as much as we can draw from these things right now. Thank you. Ja, vielen Dank. Mein Name ist Monika Müller. Um, ich habe eine kleine Bemerkung und eine Frage. Die eine Bemerkung ist, dass ich vorschlagen würde, darüber nachzudenken, dass wir nicht Geld misstrauen, sondern dass es eigentlich ein Trauen oder ein Misstrauen zwischen Menschen ist. Also ich bin Diplompsychologin, von daher gucke ich ein bisschen auf diese Seite und bevor wir Modelle weiterentwickeln, wäre vielleicht die Frage, wie können wir mit Misstrauen mhm. besser umgehen, weil es ist für mich keine Krise von Vertrauen, sondern auch eine Krise von wie können wir Misstrauen in Beziehungen besser artikulieren und handeln, mhm. um dann auch wieder zu gesunden 
Vertrauen zu kommen. Und da wäre für mich so die Frage an Sie, wie Sie sehen Sie das für Ihre Arbeit, für Ihr Haus, in der Zusammenarbeit mit Menschen im Bankbereich, in itself, also in dem Bankbereich und mit den Kunden? Ja, I, I I'm, I'm convinced that this, uh, this question of trust is, is, is at the center of this um, crisis. Credit is trust. Um, you don't extend credit if, you, if there is no trust. And a credit crisis is a crisis of trust. And many people feel let down. Uh, they think, understandably, you know, that there were people who knew everything beforehand and were tricking them out of their money, out of their hard-earned savings. The truth is that, um, I say it very bluntly, you know, we simply didn't know exactly what we were doing. We were running uh, the wrong GPS system. Um, and now we have to rebuild trust, which is a long-term um, effort. And rebuilding trust means that um, we as the industry have to um, explain what we have been doing, explain where we were wrong, explain what we can do to make things better, and uh, above all, um, you know, make a credible effort to operate, to work in the interest of the customer. Um, this trust was lost in uh, three years, you know, from 2007 to 2010, then it was gone. I think it will take 10 years or 15 to build. It's a big challenge, and I don't have a, a ready answer on how to go about it, just to work hard. Okay, um, yeah, yeah, there was one final question. Um, mein Name ist Florian Hoffmann. Ich habe eine Frage. Wir haben ganz viel über den Finanzbereich und die Finanzindustrie gehört. Mhm. Und es gibt äh, ja äh, die Vermutung, dass es ein Problem zum Beispiel beim Euro dadurch gibt, dass sich die Finanz Welt von der Realwirtschaft zu weit entfernt hat oder nicht darauf Rücksicht genommen hat. Welchen Beziehungen sehen Sie zwischen der Finanzwirtschaft und der Realwirtschaft? Also ähm, das ist vielleicht nicht doch das Abkoppeln der Finanzwirtschaft mm -hmm. von der Realwirtschaft der Hauptgrund für die Krise. Das wäre meine Frage. I think the, the financial sector was a facilitator for much what we saw in the real economy. Um, Germany couldn't have exported as much as it did if it hadn't been for the financial sector uh, which was lending money to the customers. Uh, it is no coincidence uh, that so much American mortgage paper ended up in German bank balance sheets because as uh, you know, an economist more famous than myself was once saying, we were trading BMWs uh, against American mortgage paper. Without the mortgage paper getting there, the BMWs couldn't have been sold. Um, take the euro. Uh, the euro um, flies into the face uh, of all the optimum currency theories that I know at least. Uh, it shouldn't have worked. It worked for 10 years. Why did it work? Uh, because the deficiencies um, that the optimum currency theorists identified were made up for by cheap credit. Cheap credit was the glue that kept the euro together. Uh, with cheap credit, you could fund budget deficits. With cheap credit, you could fund current account deficits without any problem. When the cheap credit ended, uh, the glue of the euro came off. And therefore, naturally, we have a euro crisis. So um, it is often said that the financial sector sort of was playing with itself and they're not looking after the real economy. I think it is a, a wrong view. Um, it would be nice if it were so, because then they could fix the problem very easily. <laughs> you could just ban the financial sector and you know, put it back into the doghouse and that would be it. But the financial sector was a great facilitator for the many parties that were celebrated in the real economy. But, but, but how, do you, um, how do you square this with the observation that the financial sector grew much more rapidly, I think, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in, in the late uh, 18, uh, 19th century than the real economy? because we had um, a global um, credit cycle where I don't think that we have ever managed to find uh, such large global imbalances um, so that uh, you could have 
you know, big current account deficits in the United States, big current account surpluses in Germany and China, all that, these very, very large current account imbalances had their counterpart in enormous uh, money flows that had to be organized, that had to be um, managed. Uh, and of course, as these money flows uh, grew in order to facilitate this real economy, they of course had spin-offs and developed a life of their own, but uh, uh, what I'm saying is it was not that the financial sector in isolation uh, expanded and was playing with itself. It was the imbalances that uh, created the need for all these financial services. Uh, why did we have so many people going into the financial sector? Because you had to send this capital around the world in order that we could have these wonderful imbalances. Uh, now with the financial sector shrinking, the current account imbalances will shrink. They will shrink globally and they will shrink in the euro area. And again, you know, this is going to give you very painful real economic adjustments. Which is bad uh, news for German export. Exporters. Which is bad news for German exports because we couldn't run this model. We could not have run this model um, if we hadn't had this financial sector. Some of the real economy people, a um, few of them, I shall say no name, have been very prominent in bashing the financial sector. They couldn't have made the money that they did if the financial sector hadn't made it work. Uh, you know, they exported, the financial sector funded it, and the taxpayer bailed the financial sector out. So in that sense, we had a, for a long time, we had basically hidden ex export subsidies, which that had to be paid in the form of bank bailouts. Okay, um, we have Peter Jung, but I would also be interested in, in, in the view of, of Thomas Huck, who's uh, the chief economist of Bosch, <laughs> as a direct reply to, to your remarks. So, uh. Yeah, could you have a micro over here, please? Yeah, but, but I would like to have him first. Vielen Dank, ich brauche mich halt jetzt nicht mehr vorstellen. Also Thomas Wu von Bosch, ähm, das Bashing lassen wir mal aus. Ich habe eine andere Frage eigentlich, kommt aber auf die gleiche Richtung. Wir haben hier gerade so eine Diskussion, was ist das richtige Modell, mit der Krise umzugehen? Die Amerikaner pumpen mehr Geld in die Wirtschaft, auch Staatsverschuldung hochgefahren, die Europäer mit sanften oder auch nicht so sanften deutschen Druck folgen eher so dem traditionellen schwäbischen Modell der Hausfrau. Ähm, und das Gefühl, was man hat, ist, Ratingagenturen lehnen sich mehr an das angelsächsische Modell. Was die Frage anbelangt, ähm, Entkopplung, Realwirtschaft, Finanzwirtschaft, das geht ja, glaube ich, mehr auf die Richtung, dass es so Handlungsanweisungen gibt, mit einer Wette auf einen Fehler von Europa Geld zu verdienen, Goldman Sachs, oder aber der Erkenntnis momentan, dass wir, wenn wir auf die finanzwirtschaftlichen Indikatoren gucken, eigentlich mitten wieder in einer tiefen Krise wie 2008, 2009 sind. Wenn wir uns die Realwirtschaft angucken, jetzt kann ich aus dem Haus reden, dann haben wir eigentlich nicht das Gefühl einer scharfen Abwärtsbewegung. Es wird alles ein bisschen moderater, aber eigentlich die Meldungen aus den einzelnen Regionen sind relativ gut. Ja, yeah, I mean, what we have presently is primarily a euro crisis, as the trust disappeared here, and we have uh, recreated some trust, uh, at least in the United States and in the uh, emerging market economies, things have gone on. The recreation of trust in the United States was achieved basically by the replacement of credit relationships through money. So that worked. So far, so good. But as I said at the beginning in my talk, um, money is also another form of credit. At least the fiat money system is, an, is another form of credit. Uh, so therefore, we are presently living off the credibility and the trust of the central bank in the United States and in the United Kingdom. Here, the ECB is much less willing to put money on the table to restore trust. And that is why here the crisis of trust is much more intense as the replacement of credit relations through fiat money is not as forthcoming as in the Anglo-Saxon economies. Um, and in this regard, the, you know, the ratings of, the, uh, of S&P and others reflect uh, this, this different approach. Uh, so we're living on borrowed times if you want. I hope that it works. But my fear is that the next uh, stage could be, if you overdo it, the next stage could be a crisis of trust in the fiat money system. Okay, we have Peter Jung. <coughs> Thank you. Um, Peter Jung. Um, 
there is a saying there is a lack of trust. Um, don't we have don't we have just a contrary? Wasn't there too much trust in these credit bubbles? And without that, maybe we wouldn't have had this uh, the large bubble. This also leads to if you look on the eurozone, uh, people thought we would have a lot of convergence, but we have much more divergence as a result of uh, the credit bubble also inside uh, the eurozone and cheap money for Greece and 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 that, some others. But that leads to the, the, a, a, a real point for for me. Uh, you talked about the Austrians. Uh, you didn't mention uh, Schumpeter. He had this uh, in a very famous paper in 1928 about the instability of capitalism. Don't we have to accept the fact that in this system, which is based on innovation, that we have to live with crises? And that capitalism is a system which may tumble from crisis to crisis, but historically became ever stronger from one crisis um, to the other one. And therefore, uh, don't we have to accept the fact that our notion on stability is maybe even in itself a flawed concept as long as we have open markets? I, you're quite right. I mean, uh, you know, there are emotions uh, were involved here on both sides. As the credit bubble expanded, uh, we had um, a um, we had overconfidence, in, in that sense, too much trust. And as the uh, bubble then burst, we are now suffering from um, excessive mistrust. I, I'm not a psychologist, but I think you know psychologists would probably consider such a behavior maybe manic depressive. And markets are, uh, as we are now uh, realizing, uh, not as rational as we thought, uh, not as efficient as we thought, but are perhaps more emotional. And therefore, they go from overconfidence or too much trust into a um, uh, too much uh, mistrust and, uh, and and lack of confidence. That that's absolutely right. And in, in that sense, since markets will people will always be people and markets will always be markets, uh, it would be f uh, illusionary to think that one could do away uh, with such emotions. And perhaps you know what we're just a reader due to rational expectations was it pretends that there is something uh, beyond that uh, that was wrong. So we have to live with it. But if you understand it. I think you can deal with it much better. And the Schumpeter paper, uh, Schumpeter paper of 1928, and that's uh, what was in fact lived out uh, in the first three years of the 30s. Um, uh, Schumpeter, von Hayek, and, and others. You know, this was not just uh, a, a uh, recession that uh, Hoover and Mellon particularly sort of tolerated because they didn't know better. Uh, this was really the idea that uh, after a big upswing, you have to have a big downswing and uh, a cleansing recession. Uh, this is why I put up the quote by Mellon. Uh, by now, I think we have learned a little bit more, so instability will be there, but we should avoid that it uh, becomes so excessive. And we have made progress. You know, Two quarters of negative growth is much better than three years. <laughs>